Hello and welcome. My name is Roni Firon, and this is The Bigger Picture, where we sit down with experts to hear about their journeys, their insights, and the big ideas that drive them. Stay tuned for today's episode. In today's episode, I spoke with Professor Nicholas Dirks, the president of the New York Academy of Sciences, former chancellor of UC Berkeley, and former dean of the humanities at Columbia University. Nicholas started his academic journey in history and anthropology, having been fascinated with Eastern cultures, especially India, from a young age. Throughout his career, Nick has embodied the spirit of the interdisciplinary approach, and the pursuit of furthering human knowledge through investigation and exploration. This conversation was definitely a hopeful one. We spoke about the role of science in our society, the wonderful innovations that science is able to produce, and we also spoke about the importance of interdisciplinary dialogue and collaboration for true scientific progress to be made. Another theme that came up is that science cannot exist on its own, it must be grounded in fundamental questions of how it can benefit the public good. Some questions came up of how we can communicate the principles of science to the public in a better, more effective way, and we explore the question of where the public's mistrust for science actually comes from. One thing that really hit home for me was Nick's call for an open-minded, curious, and exploratory approach to the scientific pursuit. It's easy for us to lose that childlike curiosity for the world, when met with the demands of daily lives, but Nick has found a way to keep that spirit of inquiry very much alive in his own career, and helps instill it in those around him, now on a large and meaningful scale through his role as president of the academy. Science is beautiful, and I hope that this conversation in some small way helps to get that message out there. When Nick refers to the New York Academy of Sciences as the academy, For me, it brings forth images of ancient Greece and Plato's Academy, which was devoted to the pursuit of knowledge and understanding the mysteries of the universe. The movement of the Enlightenment, on which our modern world of science is based on, was inspired by the philosophy of the ancient Greeks, who held up the principles of reason, virtue, and liberty. The New York Academy of Sciences is carrying that legacy onward, working to further science and our understanding of the universe with the goal being to better society and to improve our lives here as humans on this earth. Now, I hope you enjoy today's conversation, and I hope it inspires you as much as it inspired me. Let's start at the beginning. Your early interests were in history and anthropology, and much of your work revolved around Eastern cultures. What would you say drew you first of all, to anthropology and history, and what particularly to these Eastern cultures? When I was a kid, 12 years old, my father, who was a professor uh, of religious studies at Yale, decided to pack up the family and take us all to South India for a year where he was going to have an exchange professorship and also work with the local college that he was going to and the principal, which is to say the rector, vice chancellor, president uh, of, the, of that college, to think about a different kind of curriculum in a post-independent Indian educational context. Now, I didn't know that at the time. All I knew was we were going to go off to India for a year. And I went and uh, went to a local school, picked up a little bit of the Tamil language and uh, studied the South Indian drum, the Mirdangam, which... Uh, was for me a very exotic instrument, but it took me into the heart of Madras, then called Madras, now Chennai, uh, for regular lessons, and I was just fascinated. It was uh, particularly when I went to my, my my musical lessons. It was close to a major temple. Uh, it was always the center of major activity. There were not just uh, activities around ritual and worship taking place, but it was an open market People went to the big temple tank to bathe. There was clearly a great deal of commerce going on, and it was a general center of uh, social, economic, uh, cultural life uh, in that that part of South South Madras. 
Anyway, the point is that I was there for a year. It was a very impressionable year. I went back to high school in the U.S. And every time I had an opportunity to write a term paper or do a special project, somehow or another, it took me back to India. Uh, So it was really that experience that was so formative. Uh, When I went to college, I actually went to one of the two places in the U.S. where you could study the South Indian drum. And um, I started, in fact, my freshman year doing that. But I decided at some point I wasn't very good, so I stopped. (laughs) But it continued to be, in a way, the kind of counterpoint for everything else that I did, this experience that I had and this interest that developed out of that experience. Wow. No, that is an impressionable age. And I'm sure, (laughs) you know, it's amazing that in that experience, you embraced it so much. Well, you know, I have three siblings, two older brothers, one younger sister. None of them got the same uh, fascination for India. My brothers stayed in the U.S. My sister, who uh, spent uh, and, and continues to spend most of her life in Europe, uh, became fascinated later on with uh, with Europe and picked up many European languages as a result. So I was the only one, and maybe it was the age, and maybe it was my particular set of interests. But it was really a, a, a formative time for me. Uh, now, you also asked why I got fascinated by history and, and anthropology. Yes, yes. Uh, and that, too, was uh, somewhat circumstantial in the sense that when I first went to college, I imagined I would major in literature or philosophy. Uh, and uh, uh, and at that point in my life, I uh, uh, had been brought up in a particular religious background that made issues around philosophy particularly interesting. But it was also a time when uh, the U.S. was uh, you know, still engaged in its um, uh, its pursuit of uh, military victory in Vietnam. Uh, it was a time when uh, the relationship between the U.S. and Asia was clearly uh, dominating in American politics. Uh, and so while I decided not to, uh, as it were, use that particular moment to study Vietnam, which uh, uh, was in any case rather difficult to do, uh, to effectively use my interest in and relationship to India as a kind of placeholder for thinking more generally and more broadly about why it is. And I had this sense even at the time, although I didn't have it fleshed out in any kind of major way, why is it the U.S. Uh, was uh, really so unable to understand uh, the particularities of uh, Asian culture, politics, uh, and history. Uh, because it struck me that in all the debates that were going on at the time, whether around the domino theory of politics, whether around the nature of uh, of local ideological relationships to communism or uh, Marxism, uh, that there was really very little uh, actual understanding of what the Vietnamese uh, were thinking, how they were uh, themselves uh, 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 seeing America at that time, uh, and what the major issues were if you kind of scaled down from the macro ideological political levels that, of course, were dominant in Washington and in other political capitals around the world at the time. Right. There are very strong differences between these cultures, between the West and the East. And I'm interested in what you found in the Eastern cultures that you think makes it so difficult for America to understand these different ways of life. Well, you know, Asia itself is a very big place and there are a lot of differences. And uh, 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 and when I went to college, I I, I I decided to to write a th- senior thesis on India, so I studied India in more depth. Uh, the work I did was prim- uh, predominantly in the field of history. I didn't really start studying anthropology until I went to graduate school. But in the historical study that I did, which focused on Gandhi, uh, and it actually focused on Gandhi uh, in ways that changed uh, rather dramatically over the course of my study, I began... Uh, hailed as I was at the time by the nonviolent methods that were being advocated by Martin Luther King Jr. in the United States, uh, 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 I I was at the time hailed by the idea that, you know, that Gandhi had been the source for that kind of political theory that was so compelling. Uh, But but in, in, in sort of in a way seeking at the time to find a, an Asian hero, 
uh, I then, of course, subjected Gandhi to historical analysis and looked in particular at why it was that Gandhi had not been so politically popular in the south of India. What was it that happened? Uh, and how could it be that some figure like that, clearly a saint, uh, you know, someone who I saw as a kind of major role model and hero, uh, could have himself been engaged in a historical process that led to many people in the south of India finding him to be politically objectionable. That was to me both fascinating and slightly troubling at the time because, you know, I wanted a, I wanted a hero. I wanted somebody I could look to. And, uh, uh, and Gandhi was clearly somebody who had that kind of moral force, moral power that was so compelling and that also then was so influential for the civil rights movement in the United States. So as I, as I, you know, read this history, I began to realize that there were lots of other things going on in the particular case of India, or rather in this case having to do with South India. Uh, the problem was that Gandhi had gotten himself uh, effectively inserted into a local political debate between Brahmins and non-Brahmins. Okay. There was a non-Brahmin, even anti-Brahmin movement that had begun as early as 1916. Gandhi had led the non-cooperation movement between 1919 and 1922. Uh, but when he went to South India to uh, basically uh, mobilize support for the non-cooperation movement, he dismissed the anti-Brahmin, non-Brahmin fervor that was happening there at the time and instead said, look, we, we have our quarrels among ourselves. We, you know, we, can, we can deal with that after we have independence from the British. Right now, let us focus on the British. And yet... In the South, many non-Brahmins found that to be unsatisfactory. They wanted some kind of acknowledgement that there were problems that had to do with British imperialism, but there were also problems having to do with the domination of Brahmins in not just ritual and, uh, and, and religious life, but also in political and uh, economic life. Right. The <clears throat> neutrality of his position was almost a betrayal. Well, it, was, uh, it wasn't seen entirely as neutral, Okay. And, and it was see. seen as, uh, as, as kicking the can down the road. And the can that was being kicked was a can that was of great moment in the local political passions of many people in that, uh, in that, in that community and in that part of, part of India. So my historical uh, study brought me up against how, you know, things change when you move context, when you move historical context, cultural context. It, of course, uh, uh, immediately confronted me with the problem of caste. What is caste? Why is caste such a dominant uh, uh, way of organizing society in the Indian context? And what is it about caste that, on the one hand, can be seen as a religious system that organizes society around different kinds of functions, different kinds of occupations, different kinds of relationships to worship and ritual, uh, but on the other side of that, uh, also be a system of exploitation, domination, hegemony, uh, and, uh, and, and things that, you know, don't seem so great when you're actually living in a relationship that is characterized by that kind of, that kind of social stigma and domination. So Gandhi became both complicated by the work that I was doing on this historical thesis, uh, even as he became a kind of pathway to think about caste, which was in some ways, the dominant uh, um, social uh, form uh, when you were thinking in comparative sociology about the difference between India and any place else in the world. India has caste. Caste doesn't really seem to exist anywhere else. Uh, it has some uh, similarities to class. Uh, some correspondence exists with race, ethnicity. But it's actually a very different system, uh, and it's uniquely Indian. So in that context... Uh, enter anthropology, because I felt that in addition to doing historical work, I really had to understand the anthropological literature on caste and come to study much more directly uh, questions having to do with cultural difference, uh, but also how that cultural difference is organized in ways that uh, both refers to and uh, invokes a, a very long textual, ritual, religious tradition. Uh, at the same time, uh, it obviously has bearings on the nature of social organization and the kinds of questions around access to privilege, power, uh, and, uh, uh, and wealth. Can you tell us what you found is uniquely specific to a caste system versus the old class systems that we might be more familiar with from Western world? 
Well, you know, there are a number of, uh, of differences, but I think the most, uh, uh, most salient differences have to do with, first of all, the fact that you're a born into a caste. So uh, at least uh, even though there are caste groups that change their social status over time, uh, there is a real sense that you are born into a particular place in society and you have to stay in that caste group. And your caste is maintained by virtue both of expectations about who you live with, who you marry, who you eat with, uh, and, uh, and, and then even beyond that, what you do, what your occupational uh, 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 profile might be, what, uh, uh, whether you're a farmer or a merchant or a, um, or a bureaucrat administrator and, uh, and in some instances, of course, a king. Uh, but the the in addition to that the you know the the thing about caste that was so uh, difficult I think for Westerners to understand is that it seemed to be something that had been written about three four thousand years ago in ancient Vedic texts that lay out through creation stories and through uh, different kinds of textual disquisitions about the nature and meaning of caste a system that appears uh, to be uh, religiously mandated uh, to really be organized around the fact that the top caste of all, the Brahmin, is a priest. So here you have a sacerdotal system that is uh, quite unique to India, distinctive uh, in its relationship to what we've come to see as a religion that we organize around the term Hinduism. In fact, it's a very broad set of practices and beliefs that are uh, are, are, are not bound together by a single text or even, for that matter, in a monotheistic tradition, a single god, but a, uh, a, set, of, a set of practices where, nevertheless, there was a common thread uh, that always seemed to lead to caste as a system, as a structure of, uh, of social organization, uh, as well as of ritual and religious authority. Interesting. There are a lot of themes here that I would like to explore. On the one hand, how understanding the caste system better changed your perception of Gandhi as this moral hero. And on the other hand, also the question of how are Western sensibilities, how we can understand a caste system and its morality and the this way of having a social system based on a lot of exploitation coming up against this idea that it is a religious tradition? And then do we have any right to, to make a moral judgment? Well, those are exactly the questions that I became so fascinated by, and that's why I went to graduate school, and that's why I studied both history and anthropology in, uh, in, 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 my, uh, in my PhD. Uh, and indeed, uh, it was um, an interesting time to study those issues at the University of Chicago, where I did my PhD, because there were a number of very prominent social scientists who were working with Sanskritists and scholars of religious history, among others, uh, effectively to lay out what the moral and religious uh, underpinnings of caste as a moral system uh, were in both uh, its classical formulation and then in more recent uh, textual iterations as well. But it was also a time when, uh, in the 1970s, when, uh, uh, you know, there were a lot of uh, civil rights had uh, been uh, a major struggle. The Vietnam War had, had occasioned great struggle. There were real concerns about social inequality and cultural systems, especially in the area, of, in, the, in the domain of race, that in the U.S. Were, uh, were, were, were coming under withering critique. Uh, and, uh, and, and we saw that the emancipation of, of slaves in the 19th century had not actually led to social equality, and it hadn't led to it in part because there were these continued cultural beliefs that, uh, that, that really uh, involved the uh, inferiorization of, 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 of African Americans, for example. So you know, as a as a young uh, student, I was uh, very opposed to any kind of system that uh, uh, that created inequality or that inscribed inequality in in, in any kind of moral or uh, or, or social construct. Uh, and so, I found it very difficult, and it was a it was a challenge on the one hand to try to give respect to a local cultural tradition. 
that had been uh, uh, so classically, uh, you know, formulated over, as I said, three, four thousand years. On the one hand, on the other hand, which clearly involved forms of inequality that I could not, uh, I, I could not subscribe to, I could not sanction, I could not even fully understand. How how do you reconcile these two things? Well, that's been to some extent uh, what I've done in my scholarship because I uh, uh, I went off and I did extensive research uh, again in southern India because I had Tamil and then I studied Tamil further when I was in graduate school. And I, I tried to understand, uh, uh, you know, how, how indeed to, to, to bring these contradictory kinds of uh, issues uh, side by side and find a way to reconcile them. Increasingly, I came to believe that the, 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 the original religious formulation that is invoked when one is, in a way, trying to explain historically how caste came to be or what the original formulation about caste really was – was really a statement about a very small domain of ritual practice. So in the Vedic sacrifice, the Brahmin did have certain kinds of functions and roles that only the Brahmin could have. It was the speech of the Brahmin when reciting uh, Vedic hymns that could, along with ritual actions that had to be conducted, make things happen in the sense that a sacrificial uh, exchange uh, that would take place using fire, using various kinds of offerings to the god or gods, as the case may be, uh, um, how that actually did uh, seek to control uh, or at least uh, mitigate uh, the world as it impinged on human life. Uh, these were early physics experiments that were really being done on the cosmos. But that was a very small world, and that world of, uh, of, of Vedic India uh, then got transplanted onto a much larger, increasingly agricultural society uh, in which a lot of things that had nothing to do with those originary ritual exchanges and, uh, and practices uh, uh, took on a certain kind of justification. So... Uh, whether you could own property or whether you were uh, basically landless labor or whether you were uh, given property simply to learn the uh, the Vedic hymn books and conduct sacrifices and do rituals was all uh, justified by reference to a very different uh, kind of moment in, in India's history. And so you basically, uh, across India's history, saw a kind of process of justification uh, and of... Um, uh, of taking something that was really meant for a very different context and using it to say, oh, you see these relations having to do with land, with property, with, uh, with labor, uh, they all are sanctioned and justified by religious precept. When in fact, uh, there was a very, very clear distinction. So I, I believe that there was a clear historical explanation for how you had a very, very sophisticated understanding of, a, of, of, of ritual practice that then got projected onto the screen of human social relations in a very different context. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I began to train my attention on how that change or how a set of changes had happened over time and why it was uh, uh, that in particular the idea that caste was solely a religious system continued to exist, at least in some formulations, including in the formulations of many Westerners who went to India to try to understand what was going on there. Interesting. There's something that resonates for me where we're used to, in our own Western history, hearing about religious beliefs and faiths and systems that along the way become dogmatic and become uh, a means to justify behavior that is oppressive. And it's interesting to know that there's some sort of, uh, if this is happening in Eastern cultures, then it perhaps it is the nature of certain religious beliefs to become calcified and to become these dogmatic uh, indoctrinations that are very much divorced from the original faith that they were based on. Well, that's absolutely right. And, and this is uh, not the only place that this has happened in world history. 
But the philosophical conundrum is still interesting because on the one hand, uh, we can easily say, you know, religion is being used as a kind of ideology and it's being effectively transplanted from a world that has to do with, you know, very specific kinds of religious understandings and practices onto a world that has to do with economic, social, and cultural behavior. But at the same time that you're saying that, you're also imposing a particular kind of understanding of religion uh, uh, on that on that picture. And you're saying religion is separated from the world of politics or the world of economics or the world of culture. And to that extent, some of the debates that were taking place in anthropology were really about how can you understand a culture in its own terms without imposing Western values, without imposing Western constructs, uh, uh, and 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 appreciate it for what it is, not just look to see what it isn't or to find ways to criticize it on the basis of one's own assumptions. There was a very important French anthropologist in the um, in the post-war period by the name of Louis Dumont, who uh, had uh, been interested in uh, uh, in India. He was in a prisoner of war camp actually during uh, World War II and. Um, persuaded his German captors to allow him to study Sanskrit, and he did. He learned Sanskrit, and he went off to India for a research after the, after the war. Uh, but in, uh, in the 1960s, he wrote a book that uh, was translated into English as Homo Hierarchicus. It was effectively an argument saying that in the West, we have this ideology of the individual and of egalitarianism, and we talk constantly as, as, as if every individual is equal, and as, as if our, our, our social order has completely dispensed with hierarchy. But we know that isn't the case. You have only to open your eyes to see that, uh, in fact, uh, we use all kinds of justifications to, uh, uh, to, to, to basically say these individuals are different, uh, whether it's meritocratic or what have you. And he said, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a value in India that's put on hierarchy, but it's not about domination. It's a value around uh, community and interdependence, uh, and so on and so forth. And he, in fact, trained a particular kind of post-Urkheimian uh, social theory uh, on the question of caste and, um, and effectively uh, uh, argued that, um, you know, hierarchy, sure, it has its problems from the point of view of the West, but from the point of view of India, uh, our ideas of the individual and of egalitarianism also have similar kinds of problems. So at least we should be open to critique ourselves the same way we then go to critique others. <clears throat> what, he, what he did by that was to kind of raise the stakes of understanding cultural difference uh, and thinking about um, uh, uh, the kinds of questions of cultural relativism, relativism that were also very current at the time. There's something so difficult about looking at a different culture and trying to remain unbiased because you're coming into the situation with your whole contextual filter, your own cultural filter and your own moral judgments. And it's true that a lot of times we might have the implicit agenda of studying another culture without really wanting to understand, but trying to learn how we can change. And there's, there's difficulty there of really being open to seeing the differences and perhaps the systems that are governing our world aren't necessarily the best. And maybe there's, there's room for, for both sides of the story. And with that said, there's also certain cultures where you ask yourself, what is the line that we draw in terms of oppression, right? If uh, women aren't able to drive a car, right? And is that, is that because of their religious belief and should we respect it? There's, there's very, uh, very deep questions here of how do you study another culture? Because there's an aspect where you're never coming to the situation completely unbiased. We try in our studies and in science in general to be as unbiased as we can. Well, what we try to do, of course, is to uh, occupy a certain kind of universalist perspective. And we try to say, you know, we can stand outside of our own histories, our own cultures, our own particular interests, 
And we can objectively, because we're using scientific methods, observe what something is and basically describe it and then analyze it. What anthropology did for me was to effectively formalize the kind of conundrum that I had as a college student and raise uh, the level of, you know, that larger set of questions about how you understand and see things when you are located in a particular culture. Now, we're at a moment in world history where there is a rush, I think, to judgment often about, uh, about other, other groups, and there has been a reaction uh, uh, to uh, what has clearly been a long history of invidious stereotyping of different groups, of other groups. Uh, and I think there's been a retreat from using culture as either a kind of alibi or a form of explanation. But at the same time, uh, there's been a kind of um, absence of reflection about what the ground on which one can actually make these kinds of moral judgments really is and how one might achieve a much more dialogic, if I uh, can put it uh, in, in, in those kinds of terms, uh, a much more dialogic understanding of culture, which is to say that there's no one simple truth about some of these issues. It's not to say that there aren't, there isn't truth at the core of what we observe, but there is so much that is affected by where we sit, how we look at something, so that the only way we can really capture the complexity of social and cultural phenomena is to see it through multiple perspectives. And in that sense, I'm I'm suggesting that it has a dialogic character because it at least opens up the possibility that there is a negotiation uh, and some kind of reflective uh, uh, and, and insistence on a, on, a, on a reflective engagement with the complexity of, uh, of, of trying to understand these social and cultural forms. Absolutely. I think that at the core of truth, there is always paradox in a sense. It's very difficult to really get at the truth, especially when you're considering your own individual sense-making capabilities. And it is in the dialogue and in the differences of opinion that I think we get closer to the truth. And in a sense, we need different personalities and we need different cultural points of view to, to balance society as a whole. And when people kind of um, dig their feet in and you know, camp in one school of thought without seeing the other side and the merits to, you know, different opinions and different ways of life. I think that's when we become really blinded and we move further away from the truth. Yeah. And these, of course, are difficult things to think about in a, in a, at a time when there's so much, uh, you know, post-truth or, you know, deliberate untruth. Uh, when the misinformation machinery is uh, cranking at a level that it never has been able to be for because now of the, ubi- the ubiquity of the internet and of, uh, of, of social media. So I, I say this all with, uh, with some hesitation uh, because, of course, I, I, I'm not disputing uh, either that there are facts – uh, or that there are truths that exist uh, in, in, in the things that we study and the things that we as, whether we're scientists or social scientists or humanists, uh, seek to understand. That being said, and I can use a, a, a contemporary, con- contemporary example, uh, and we can go back and talk more about interdisciplinariness and things like that that have to do with uh, my own work between history and anthropology. But... You know, we live at a time uh, in the pandemic when we clearly are seeing very different understandings of science, of vaccines, uh, of disease, uh, of uh, social practices that are advised by public health workers, and 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 indeed by uh, a whole set of other things that uh, that really are fundamental to the current crisis we have in uh, in the pandemic. And, and I think, you know, it, it, has made, uh, it has made some of us believe that it's just a question of following the science. And yet we've seen that's easier said than done. 
But it's not just that it's easier said than done. It also is that when you look, for example, at vaccine hesitancy, you find that some of the people who don't feel comfortable taking a vaccine actually have uh, ways of seeing the vaccine that are very different. And they're not necessarily, or at least not solely, fueled by a particular kind of political position that is simply against vaccines because they're being promulgated by the state or by the Democratic political party in the U.S. or by scientists who are seen as uh, voices of not just authority but of uh, profiteering if they have anything to do with the big pharma industry or what have you. Because, in fact, the whole field of, again, to go back to anthropology, of medical anthropology has been for some time uh, a field that has said you have to, you have to look at culture if you're actually going to uh, engage people in ways that will help them avail of medicine, but also live healthier lives in terms of all the things that go into healthcare. So that in something as fundamental as our health, where science has played such a dramatic role in increasing uh, 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 our general access to medical care of one sort or another, lifespans have increased dramatically in the last hundred years, in some sense, that's been the biggest transformation wrought by science of any other in terms of our everyday, everyday experience. You know, we're not expecting that life expectancy now is going to be, you know, at 35, 40, 45. It's uh, very different now. But all of that being said, we are still, whatever the advances of science, living in a world in which people see things through their cultural lenses. And in that sense, I, 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 I really have felt that my, uh, my, my disciplinary experience in anthropology has a lot uh, that I, uh, I cannot forget uh, and must not forget and have to, have to bring, even when I'm thinking about questions having to do with, uh, with the physical and natural sciences. Right. There's something in <sighs> the approach today that is very political, where whenever I hear a political conversation around things like whether to get vaccinated or not. I, and, and all sorts of other debates that are going on. My inclination is always to consult psychology. I mm -hmm, think that mm -hmm. the questions are a lot more psychological and in a sense also anthropological. We need to understand the differences in culture and we need to understand the individual and his psychological makeup if we're to make progress in science and to make progress in society because it's not enough to move scientific innovation forward. But if, for instance, we're, we design a vaccine that is able to, uh, to stop the spread of COVID and half the population isn't getting vaccinated, then, then there's a missing piece here. And so moving to, to this uh, world of science now, I wanted to ask you, did you ever see yourself, you know, starting your career in history and anthropology, did you ever see yourself coming to the position of being the president of the New York Academy of Sciences? So I'm going to answer that by going back a bit. Okay. My first teaching job where I taught history and anthropology was at the California Institute of Technology. Now, I was not there to teach physics, and uh, I was not there to, you know, to teach science. I was there because Caltech had uh, developed a core curriculum that included a very serious commitment to having Caltech students as undergraduates take a lot of courses in humanities and social science to fill out the picture, as it were, of the world. And the course that I was first asked to teach was Introduction to Asian Civilization. So it was a required course for uh, uh, for Caltech freshmen. Now, in that context, I actually I had a bit of a tough time because I had to teach about China and Japan and Southeast Asia as well as India. And India I could teach about, but but I I, I would uh, I, I would go to the Caltech faculty club for lunch, and there were two round tables in the club that were uh, not to be reserved. And the idea was that you would have faculty from all over the institute go and just sit down and have conversations across discipline. And one of the first lunches that I had at the, at the Athenaeum was uh, at a round table, and it turned out that I was at a table with Richard Feynman and Murray Gelman, 
two Nobel laureates in physics. Wow. Pretty impressive. Uh, but what was interesting was that they were just so interested in talking to me about the work I do. And they were especially interested in India on the one side and anthropology. They were, they, they, what is that? You know, what is this field? Uh, and, uh, and so we agreed that we would have, you know, regular lunches once, once a week. And uh, we talked about all sorts of things. And I, uh, I decided that I needed to understand something about their world. So, of course, I went out and got the, got the tape of Feynman's lectures on physics. <laughs> and I was able to follow it for a good long time. But it, 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 at some point, I, I, you know, I lost it. So I thought he's going to be able to explain it to me. And there were certain things he could explain. He was a wonderful teacher. And he had a great gift for making complex things, you know, very straightforward. But I realized still, I didn't really understand gravity, for example, in, uh, in the terms I would need to. And if I were going to, to have a conversation above a very general level with him. So I did have this sense uh, when, I was, when I was there as an assistant professor years ago uh, that um, there were two cultures that uh, that existed in in all universities, and the sciences and the non sciences were those cultures. And you could perhaps find some bridges, uh, and you could find some points of connection. But these were really different worlds, and uh, it was terrific to have these conversations. But you know, they weren't really going to change the character of the work that I myself was doing. <clears throat> now, to some extent, uh, I was simply recognizing that uh, that's the way in which the sciences have been in most universities around the world for really going back to, say, the late 19th, early 20th centuries when the disciplines as we know them today were, were first really formed and, and established. But if you go back in history and you go back even to the beginning and middle of the 19th century, those two cultures didn't really exist. Somebody like Darwin, for example, was, uh, was clearly a natural scientist, and he studied science in a very serious kind of way. But he was clear that when he was understanding or seeking to understand the artifacts from the voyage of the Beagle that ultimately became the archive for his understanding of the evolution of species— that he was using his imagination, he was using his speculative sensibility, he was looking at discrete things that he had to create connections between and among in ways that was not, strictly speaking, solely determined by discrete experiments that could be conducted in a laboratory. In fact, of course, there was no laboratory for the history of evolution. It was ultimately a work of great imagination that then uh, used some experiments and what has been since Darwin advanced by uh, greater levels of, uh, of laboratory experimentation. But in the first instance, a theory of, of human origins that, uh, that, that couldn't be said to be located either in a kind of humanistic tradition or a strictly scientific tradition. Right. It was born out of creativity. It required creativity, and it required a, a very, very uh, uh, broad sense of how human knowledge is both uh, created and then, and then organized and constructed. Can you describe to us the two cultures that you saw and kind of, you know, their characteristics? Well, the two cultures idea was, of course, inscribed in a very famous lecture that was given in London in 1959 by C.P. Snow, who was himself a trained scientist who then became uh, a, a novelist and, uh, and writer uh, in British society. Uh, and he, uh, he, he gave these, these lectures uh, uh, and was very critical of the old humanistic elite in the UK. Uh, and he felt that they were uh, contemptuous of science and they shouldn't be. They, his basic argument was that, you know, s scientists might not fully appreciate all the things that humanists do, and maybe they should have a broader uh, understanding of, of, of the complexity of the human condition. But they were doing things that were absolutely critical. And of course, this was when, you know, the power of, 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 of nuclear uh, explosions was obviously clear to everybody. And uh, this was a time of, uh, 
huge anxiety around the possibility of nuclear war. And so all of a sudden, science was this very, uh, very clear and present danger on the one side. But on the other side, this was post-penicillin. This was when scientific discoveries were beginning to really radically change uh, human health. Uh, and when the promise of, uh, of, of, of science and technology really was uh, extraordinarily powerful for, uh, for, for people who were looking at, you know, was the world going to be able to feed all the people in it? Was this world going to be able to, uh, to, 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 to create better living conditions uh, and, and the world had new modes of transportation, et cetera, et cetera? And, and Snow uh, uh, was simply arguing that, you know, these two cultures were actually going to, uh, if they continued to operate as separate cultures, get in the way of progress and get in the way of progress that, uh, that would be critical. <clears throat> so, so Snow said, we've got to start breaking down these cultures and we have to begin in the university because if we can't create among, you know, intellectuals and scientists and social scientists and humanists a uh, ground on which we can talk across these different kinds of disciplinary boundaries. How can we expect society at large to appreciate, uh, you know, the importance of science in their world? Anyway, that was 1950s. That's the origin of the phrase. And it was remarkably uh, prescient in the way in which it characterized how, uh, how things took place on university campuses. And I used that phrase to characterize how I saw Caltech. And then I went off and I taught at the University of Michigan. And then I taught at Columbia. And then I went to Berkeley. All universities have minimally two cultures. But Snow was, was onto something. And I think, I think his, his, his sense that... Uh, that we really weren't doing enough to try to figure out how to communicate across disciplines uh, was, uh, was, was both a way of saying the disciplines themselves were beginning to get in the way of real advances in human knowledge and also of anticipating some of the things we were just talking about, that science alone was not going to be able to solve all these kinds of issues, even as social science or humanities alone is not going to be able to, you know, deal with some of the kinds of pressing things that we in the 20th century had to deal with. So my, my mentioning the two cultures in relationship to my, uh, you know, my lived experience of teaching in American universities from, uh, from the 1980s onward uh, is a way of saying that at first I accepted this as being a kind of condition of intellectual life and the physicists would do their thing and I would do my thing and I could be comfortable and I could even be interdisciplinary. I could bring history and anthropology together, you know, which was a big thing in its time, I think, you know, I put together in the University of Michigan, a joint PhD program in history and anthropology. It shook up the historians. It shook up the anthropologists. It was good. <laughs> I think it was, you know, an important program. It continues to this day and it's, uh, it, it, it does train different kinds of, of graduate students who do different kinds of work. <clears throat> By the same token, you can imagine, you know, much more ambitious ways of bringing together psychology and uh, biology and anthropology and other fields that clearly have a lot to learn from each other. But as one thinks more broadly about the two cultural, uh, the two cultures formulation of snow, uh, one really does, uh, uh, I think, begin to recognize that uh, that as important as it is to train people doing science in the fields that they need to understand and, uh, and, and, and master in order to really do top level research, uh, we shouldn't stay in our silos and stay there and assume somehow that that's, that's good enough. Uh, and, and, and so, so, so one kind of trajectory that I'm describing here is it, trajectory where I've come to see increasingly that the kind of understandings I came to appreciate when I was uh, studying India and then when I began to look at anthropology are not irrelevant at all to the world of science, even as the more you understand about science and the way in which scientific knowledge is, is, is developed, the more you understand as well that it requires not just an openness to other disciplines, but again, uh, a capacity to uh, uh, to recognize the, the 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 foundational significance of the imagination 
of, cre- of, 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 of creative and also of moral, uh, uh, um, efforts to, uh, to bring one's knowledge to bear on the world in a way that will produce the maximum good for the maximum people. I think that this interdisciplinary approach is so necessary. Also on a societal cultural level, there's this idea of other people and their different points of view of the world, their different perceptions of the world, completing our own perception of the world. We need these different ideas and we need these different points of view. And when you look at it in the intellectual space, these are very, you know, differently wired people. And, and for instance, an engineer and a physicist versus a, you know, French literary professor. But the, I, and I think maybe one of the things that blocks this interdisciplinary approach is that if you look at the individual intellectual wanting to advance his field, there's this mis- misconception that if you focus solely on your field and you read only papers that are being produced from your field, that this will be the best way for you to progress forward. But there's something so rich about this interdisciplinary focus where you draw upon so many different disciplines and it sparks your creativity in a way that can't be done otherwise. You, you, you learn, it opens up so many different doors in your mind when you, when you learn about a concept, for instance, in physics that mirrors a concept in biology and mirrors a concept in psychology. And it opens you up to a new world and it gets the creative juices flowing. And I think just that alone, if people would understand that, would help interdisciplinary conversations move along a bit more. And the other, the other part of what we were mentioning was there is this paradoxical nature to things where there isn't only one truth. You can't rely only on science and go 100% into science. You need to balance it with an understanding of the human and of morals and psychology and anthropology. And you need to have, you know, the more you advance in the hard sciences, the more you need to understand the the humanities, I think. And in our time today, with the example of the vaccine, it's it's so obvious that we're not giving enough focus to these things, to the human element behind these things, uh, especially in the... in trying to communicate these ideas. There's this idea, I think, of if only we could explain science a little bit more clearly than everyone would understand. But I think there's a lot of emotional blocks that people have as well that need to be understood. And it's only through this interdisciplinary dialogue that we'd be able to make any advances. Well, again, there, 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 there are different domains in which this operates. On the one hand, uh, some of the kinds of interdisciplinary discussions and Conversations that can take place or should, in my view, should take place on university campuses are still going to be at a level of technical difficulty that won't necessarily open up science to a more public appreciation and understanding. Uh, and I think, you know, I think uh, uh, there are a lot of examples of how uh, simple kinds of interdisciplinary exchanges can advance science in fairly traditional ways that are very, very important. Uh, you uh, see right now that many, many physicists uh, have begun to work in the field of biology because biology with, you know, first with DNA but now with uh, RNA, is the, it's the place where some of the most important questions in science are being uh, examined. Uh, and so you have a lot of physicists who, uh, and you have a field now called biophysics that uh, that that gives a certain name to that. But it's uh, it's 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 really about uh, taking the, the the background that you have as a as a trained physicist and then using that to look at the at the world of uh, molecular and cell biology that has produced some of the greatest insights that we've had over the last uh, uh, 10, 20, 30 years. So there. There, there's, there's, there's a, there's a kind of benefit to interdisciplinariness even within, you know, some of these domains. There's also what we were talking about, as well, though, which is that uh, if you really need to think about the human, 
uh, you have to think in, 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 in cross-disciplinary ways. Neuroscience, fascinating field that is making uh, incredible strides in, uh, in its understanding of, of, of the brain and of brain function, uh, is, uh, is making these strides in part because uh, brain imaging is getting better and better, and we have new kinds of imaging technologies that have uh, been able to, to, to represent for us brain activity uh, in ways that are far more detailed and sophisticated than was possible even five years ago. A colleague of mine from Berkeley uh, has actually been able to, uh, to, to take an image of, uh, of a certain set of brain images themselves uh, that almost looks like a kind of old um, old movie, you know, from the from the earliest days of uh, of cinematography, where you see this kind of you know Slice. flashes and yeah. slices, you know. But uh, uh, but you know these are uh, these are opening up all kinds of new opportunities for understanding the nature of the brain. But if you're going to understand the brain, if you're going to think about questions of consciousness, if you're going to think about, you know, what is distinctive to human consciousness, what is, uh, uh, what is the capacity of a machine to replicate uh, certain kinds of calculations, certain kinds of judgments, in other words, to replicate what humans can do, well, you have to think uh, a, a lot harder about what you mean by what it is to be human, along with what and how even one's understanding of the human can be advanced by understanding how computers work. Right, uh, neural and, and, networks. And by, and... Yeah, networks and the like. And now, of course, we have a whole new generation of neuronal, uh, uh, you know, quantum computing that is, uh, that is, that is going to uh, change the way in which we even think about computation as a, uh, as a discrete activity that, you know, is just the accumulated uh, effect of having a lot of ones and a lot of a lot of a lot of o's so it's uh it, it works at a lot of different levels and it works in a lot of different ways that i think are 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 going to be fundamental to to the next generation of advances of our understanding and fields that uh, really go across a, a wide range of areas including in as I say, in neuroscience, perhaps in particular. But take all the other big scientific challenges and issues of our day. We've been talking about vaccines and about the virus, climate change. You know, we're, uh, we're, we're struggling to understand uh, um, both what the effects are of, uh, of, of human activity in relationship to the extreme weather events that we're now seeing more and more pronounced across the world. Uh, uh, but we're also trying to acquaint people with the, with the recognition that, uh, on the one hand, there are a lot of things that we need to change uh, in our everyday lives if we're going to actually take climate change seriously. And you have to think about short-term and long-term uh, uh, Pluses and minus, benefits and costs and benefits, uh, and 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 huge, possibly huge investments in new ways of, of 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 generating energy. If one isn't really going to make any kind of difference at all, and 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 yet, you know, climate change too has become so highly politicized, uh, and uh, and distrust of science and distrust of scientists will have huge potential effects on our capacity to do anything at all. Uh, that would might be sufficient to actually deal with the with the current threats of of climate change. So, when when you really begin to think about the the place of science in the world, all of our disciplinary silos make less and less sense. Right. I think as we're saying this, one of the problems is how do we define science itself? And in German, I believe. And I'm probably going to pronounce this completely wrong, but they have a term um, Wissenschaft and it encompasses both the hard sciences and the humanities. It's kind of, um, think of like the study of, it's a, a word that encompasses a scholarship as well. And this conception of science as progressing human knowledge, 
I think is a much more holistic approach and would get a lot more people on board and it would help progress in these fields. Because as you're talking about climate change, I'm thinking of, okay, so there's the innovations that we want to make. There's the um, renewable energy and, and all of these things. But then there's the business aspect of how do you get people on board to invest money in this research, right? How do you change the incentive systems that exist today already where companies will, you know, if the bottom line is cheaper, they're going to fish the fish in one location, send them to another location to get trimmed and then sell them in a different location. And you've the carbon footprint of that is ridiculous. But if the bottom line is cheaper then that incentive system, obviously incentivizes something that's very, very much, uh, you know, not beneficial to our, to our environment. So it's all of these disciplines working together. And, and so when we're talking about science, on the one hand, it's creating a more interdisciplinary conception of science where it's scholarship itself and it's advancing human knowledge. But then there's another issue of dealing with this idea of scientism, right? And science itself sometimes becoming dogmatic and people not, and in these silos can very much create this narrow view and you want to keep people, you know, with the eye on the prize, really knowing what are our goals and how are we going to get there and not becoming indoctrinated in, in a narrow kind of conception of reality. You know, it's, it's important to remember that, you know, there are uh, scientific uh, uh, forms of knowledge that require a huge amount of a huge amount of investment of time and, and energy to even get to the point where you're beginning, you, you can begin to do your own research in a in a in a meaningful way. Uh, if if one opens everything up to the point where you know we all think we can again go back to being early nineteenth century generalists, we're going to lose a lot in that. In that, in that transition. So there continues to be, obviously, the, uh, the need to, uh, to learn disciplines in particular kinds of ways that really enables one to, to understand the, uh, the fundamental science that, that you need for any particular uh, subspeciality uh, and research activity. So, so none of this is an argument for just you know, becoming a generalist. But I think, I think in uh, in in looking at how we organize our universities, how we organize uh, uh, you know the practices that have to do with the creation and then the dissemination of knowledge, uh, we 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 do have to be a little more creative in in how we think about this. And of course, I'm thinking about you know how do we organize universities. When I was uh, the dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Columbia. I had the opportunity to help design a new science building uh, that uh, was going to provide much needed state of the art laboratory space for physicists, chemists, biologists, and engineers. And we decided at some point that the uh, the way we would uh, organize this 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 laboratory building was to insist that uh, that basically we co-located scientists from different fields next to each other. Each floor had three laboratories. And so we said, we're going to have one of each. No, we had more than each, more than three. But we, uh, we, we, had, uh, we insisted that there be biologists working next to chemists, being, uh, working next to physicists, working next to engineers. And, uh, and this, was, uh, this was not business as usual. Uh, and in fact... There were some colleagues at Columbia who said, you know, if you're going to go over to this new building, you're leaving the department. Uh, and, uh, and, and you're going into some other kind of project, that's fine, but it's not going to be, you're not going to be contributing to our department in the same way. How and that tribal. had to do with, no, it had to do with, you know, who controls a laboratory. Got and it. if some scientist leaves, then do I get that, does my department get that laboratory back? And of course, there are certain things that you need for certain kinds of science. If you're a chemist, you really need to have more fume hoods than if you're a, 
you know, doing a different kind of science. And uh, fume hoods are cheaper if you put them closer to the top of the building so that you can get... Some practical considerations. Yeah, there, there are various and sundry extraordinarily important and uh, consequential in terms of the investments uh, uh, considerations that go into designing laboratories. But we did stick to our principle of co-location, of, of cross-disciplinary co-location. And the scientists found this to be once they got into the building and once we resolved all the kinds of practical and organizational issues that were part of this, they found it to be very exciting. Because it turned out that these kinds of, uh, of, of just proximities created very interesting outcomes. You know, at some point, the chemist would talk to the engineer about something they were doing, and all of a sudden, there would be a proposal for a different kind of way of building a machine or thinking about how you evaluate a problem. So what I'm really referring to in part here is that there are things we can do without blowing everything up. Oh, of course. That, uh, of course. You know, that, that really will advance uh, the ways in which we, 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 we think about um, research work. Uh, and some of this research is, is, is in fundamental science. It's not all to be uh, applied science. Uh, it's often the case that some of the most extraordinary discoveries in the world have come out of cur- what we call curiosity-driven science, uh, basic research, fundamental research. Uh, because that's when you really don't know what you're going to find. You're, you're, you're just interested in a problem. You know, if you hear the speeches that are given every year by Nobel laureates in fields like physics and uh, medicine and, uh, and the like, you realize pretty quickly that uh, uh, many of these scientists – uh, are being recognized for something they discovered that has enormously important practical benefit, but that they didn't begin by looking for those practical outcomes. At Berkeley, uh, first year I got there, Randy Sheckman, biologist, had been interested in how uh, osmosis worked within and between cells. He was using yeast for his experiments. And one thing led to another, and before long, he actually discovered how to create synthetic insulin that can be used for diabetics around the world in a much more uh, uh, economical way to, to, to actually provide uh, the insulin needed for, for the needs of patients. It's not what he was intending to do, but it's what his process of discovery led to. By the same token, when I was at Columbia, a wonderful biologist there by the name of Martin Chalfie, uh, had become interested in glowworms for reasons having to do with uh, the particular biology of the glowworm. But because the glowworm was completely transparent, it turned out you could then begin to do experiments in the glowworm that allowed you to actually see how metabolism worked, to see how different substances were uh, uh, were, would affect the organism, uh, and it's revolutionized the way in which so, certain kinds of biological research can take place. Again, uh, it wasn't what he set out to do in the beginning. There are, you know, as many examples of this as there are examples of, of great science. So, so we need to keep uh, that kind of capacity to do research that nobody really quite understands what what it's all about. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it sometimes uh, is, is, is put under the rubric of the usefulness of useless knowledge. Abraham <laughs> Flexner wrote a book about that a, a long time ago. He was one of the people who helped set up the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. But it, it, it's, it's part of what, uh, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm hoping for here, which is a slightly more open sense of how knowledge is created and how serendipity is part of that. And serendipity, both in terms of who you're interacting with, who you're talking to, and what you're trying to understand. It's to introduce more curiosity, an exploratory spirit, right? To allow for creativity to happen, to allow for this free flow of information and and this serendipitous, you know, discoveries, they they often happen when there's there's this open mindedness in the approach. Uh, even if you're, you know, looking to 
to discover something uh, completely different. It's this open-mindedness that can many times help you make these discoveries. And, and it is very exploratory in the sense that we often don't know where we're going. There's a, a sense of, you know, we're mapping out reality uh, with science and that uh, within that there is this exploration. What do you think we need today in the universities and in research institutions to to have more of that? Well, the first thing is that with all the emphasis now increasingly on trying to get universities to be more accountable for training students to have discrete uh, occupational outcomes and vocational training really almost uh, at the end of their educational journey, we need to be able to uh, protect uh, uh, the university as a place where people can uh, simply indulge uh, their interest in uh, in just exploring something uh, and exercising their imagination uh, in being creative. Now, to do that, one also needs to, I think, maintain uh, what sometimes is called the liberal arts basis of, of undergraduate education, and that would effectively mean the kinds of things I was teaching at Caltech, the importance of ensuring that a student who wants to do physics is also looking at cultural questions or philosophical questions or historical questions, because it turns out to be helpful and it turns out to uh, to open the mind in ways that are, I think, really important, even in very narrow and technical fields at the end of the day. But by the same token, in terms of really how we organize research, I think the uh, the key here is to, again, maintain the capacity for uh, institutions to do both applied but also fundamental research, maintain the uh, organizational interest in bringing uh, scientists and social scientists out of their out of their own silos and interacting with each other in, in, in meaningful and substantive ways that uh, really does challenge them to think differently about what they're doing and how they're doing it. And at a time when, you know, for example, technology really is changing so dramatically, uh, it's, uh, it is critical, for example, even in the space of computer science and, uh, uh, and thinking about artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, all the kinds of things that are, you know, obviously changing the technological landscape in which we live be pursuits that are not done just uh, uh, by themselves. These are things that impact every other part of society, and uh, it will be important for both students and uh, advanced researchers in those fields to uh, to be very uh, uh, connected across uh, different disciplinary backgrounds, orientations, interests, and, uh, and perspectives. Right. In the example of robotics, to really design artificial intelligence, you need to have a definition for what is intelligence and what is consciousness. And there's philosophical questions that come into play and psychological ones, also ethical ones. There's always the conundrum with um, the autonomous drivers of if you must uh, run someone over, <laughs> right? They, they played out these, uh, these experiments what would a human do? What What is more ethical? How do we make these judgments? So all of these things very much converge. And I think, you know, what we're pointing to is the more we progress, the more uh, these disciplines do diverge and depend on one another. Well, what you're referring to in part is uh, uh, in what is in, in moral philosophy often called the uh, the trolley problem. Right, right. And you have these kinds of puzzles that you have to uh, debate between, um, you know, you have the trolley driver who's going down the trolley and at some point, you know, the brakes fail and you could either go left or you could go right. If you go left, you know, there's uh, uh, one person who's uh, clearly got a cane, looks like they might be old and, uh, you know, that. and then on the other side you have five children. So you have to make this choice, you know, do you... Right. What do you do? What do you and, do? And there's another situation where 
you cannot do anything and just let the trolley yeah, do and its then, thing. And, and, and then, then you don't want to make a choice. Agent, so you're not right. the actual agent of somebody's <laughs> death and destruction. So uh, you don't have to accept the charge of agency. Uh, but, you know, now with autonomous vehicles, we know that, of course, it's not so much the trolley driver, it's the coder. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden, the job of the of, of the coder becomes a much more fraught one because they have to imagine all kinds of outcomes that could be uh, really very difficult uh, at the moment, but which, nevertheless, they have to anticipate in writing the code. What happens when the brakes fail? What do you do? Do you do you make any distinction between um, uh, between you know outcomes that that uh, none of which are good, but uh, but some of which may be seen as better than others, uh, uh, depending on these kinds of moral trade-offs that, you know, that the trolley problem, of course, identifies and experiments with. So the, you know, the, 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 the set of questions that, that now are, uh, in effect, being located within the domain of, of coders and designers or techno- technology designers uh, is, 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 is really very consequential uh, but of course, uh, you know, the moment you start asking these questions, you don't necessarily want to just have somebody who's done nothing but computer science all their lives, right? You want to have somebody who's actually capable of thinking about ethical uh, questions and quandaries and predicaments. <clears throat> when you're looking at uh, at the operations of artificial intelligence right now, you know, because it's now been demonstrated that, uh, you know, if 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 you use experience effectively uh, to create the data that goes into a very big data set for a set of algorithms to process and then uh, and then you know churn out for you you're going to you're going to have the, the 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 biases and the stereotypes and all the issues that are part of lived experience get condensed in uh, in the outcome of that algorithmic process. Uh, so you see time and time again that you have uh, racist um, stere- uh, stereotypes and, and depictions of, of, of individuals, uh, you know, basically look like they're natural, uh, they're natural outcomes of a, of a computational process instead of, you know, basically uh, the, the refraction of, of, of something that's out there in the world that then, of course, through an uh, insensitive algorithm simply gets – gets passed through. So we've seen that. We've seen that, you know, there are all kinds of questions in, uh, in the way AI processes data. Uh, but we also know that AI is going to have extraordinary power in a huge number of domains. And, um, and, and so all of a sudden, uh, you know, how do you then, you know, create the ideal coder for, uh, for a set of algorithms that are going to have you know, potentially huge impact on, uh, on, on certain kinds of outcomes. And, um, and, and, and so in that sense, you know, this kind of interdisciplinary ethos, I'm so interested in, well, I've been interested in, in, in trying to enact this across my role, uh, my roles in administration at uh, both Columbia and Berkeley. Uh, but, uh, but I now see as, as, as really part of the, the task of, uh, of a scientific, uh, learned academy and learned society uh, to find ways to, to to specify even more because the the academy unlike the university and the academy draws on the work that is done in universities among other scientific institutions and uh, and 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 individuals but it's specifically about relating science to various kinds of social issues and. So it's all the more a, a, a place where, you know, the kind of uh, – these kinds of connections, these kinds of synergies, these kinds of uh, even moments of serendipity can, I think, be encouraged in, 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 very important, uh, in very important ways. Can you tell us what you find so unique about the Academy? Okay. So the New York Academy of Sciences was established in 1817 as the Lyceum. At that time, it was really more of a school than an academy, although – Academy bears some of that uh, history in its own in its own etymology, but it was established as a place, really, for individuals across the greater New York area to get together and hear from scientists about 
the research they were doing, uh, and uh, and to 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 get together to uh, uh, really pose questions that they might find interesting to pursue. Now, the academy was formed after Columbia, but before NYU. And many of the people who were part of the academy, in fact, played very important roles in the development of New York University. So <clears throat> it was there at a kind of early moment in the history of university life in New York. But it played a consequential uh, uh, role uh, even in, in the formation of, the, of, 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 of its, some of its great universities. It also had very close connections with other institutions over the course of its history, including the American Museum of Natural History. For many, many years, uh, the Academy did as much work in the area of natural history as it did in the area, for example, of the biological and life sciences, which has increasingly been its focus since, really since uh, the 1940s and 50s, uh, when it began to hold some of the most important conferences on the development of new kinds of antibiotics. So uh, in 1946, the Academy held the first major conference on, uh, on the first set of antibiotics that were developed post-penicillin. Uh, it's also had major conferences on uh, HIV, on SARS, uh, and most recently, of course, on the coronavirus. But in addition to its work in, in in the biological and life sciences, it's 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 over the course of its history, it's it's engaged many different kinds of questions from every branch of science, including from anthropology. <clears throat> Margaret Mead, great anthropologist, uh, was vice president of the academy for many years in the 1950s and 60s, and her professor from Columbia, Franz Boas was actually the president of the New York Academy back in the uh, early 20th century. Uh, and that's very meaningful for me in part because uh, at Columbia, I held the Franz Boas Chair of Anthropology. So yes, it, I know. It, it does uh, establish a direct, uh, a direct genealogical connection. But the Academy also, it attracted, you know, very interesting people uh, in its early years. It had people like Thomas Jefferson as, uh, as members and speakers uh, and, of course, uh, 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 it it, uh, it it featured you know just about all the really interesting people doing science, uh, and not just in New York but across the East Coast during uh, during those decades. Uh, in its uh, in its in its history, uh, it for example too was a place where Dar Darwin's theories about human evolution were first presented and discussed in the United States. Uh, we have some documentation in our archive here of a major conference that took place uh, uh, around uh, uh, around Darwin's work. It was 1909, 50th anniversary of the publication of The Origin of Species and 100th anniversary of Darwin's uh, life and uh, uh, since he was was born in, in 1809. But it again was uh, was the place where uh, where questions around human evolution were discussed uh, in in New York and indeed on the East Coast. As universities got bigger and uh, began to perform some of the same kinds of activities that the academy had performed in the 19th century, the academy shifted, and it shifted increasingly to be a place that brought university scientists together with scientists working in industry, as well as increasingly with not just scientists, but with individuals and institutions that don't normally interact with each other. Most recently uh, in relationship, for example, to United Nations or other kinds of non-governmental organizations. So what the Academy has always done across its now 204-year history is to convene people across different sectors of society. And it's adjusted over time as uh, different institutions have grown to the point where they can themselves enact some of the kinds of, perform some of the same kinds of things that the Academy has done at, at, at earlier moments. But it keeps reinventing itself around that theme, around the theme of, of, of bringing together people from different places, from different backgrounds, from different institutional identities and sectors. So for me, it's perfect. You know, this is a place that after spending a lifetime in the university allows me to connect 
my passion for the knowledge that is created and taught in universities with institutions and with publics well outside of the university walls. And today is a time, I think, that we are seeing with the pandemic uh, and with climate change, the importance of of connecting science to, to broader public issues and to broader modes of public understanding that I think carry the spirit of the early academy, but translate it into, uh, into the present time uh, and in relationship with the present needs. My hope for the academy is that it will become uh, seen as the place, not just in New York, but globally. And we can now say that because of the fact that we're using digital means for every event that we do here that explores uh, the relationship between uh, scientific knowledge and the public good, that we are a place that will bring the, uh, the best and most interesting people from across these different kinds of backgrounds and sectors, but put them to work in thinking not only about solutions to some of the big global challenges that we confront, uh, but also to ways that we might be able to communicate what science is, what science does, why it is that science is not just one set of settled facts, but a process of discovery, a process of exploration, a process of working through things that, through the experiments that need to be done on any given problem, can produce what seem to be different kinds of results at any given time, but that nevertheless develops and accumulates a sense of uh, of, 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 of a certain problem that uh, ultimately creates a, a consensus around uh, to the point that we can actually say, uh, you know, this is the scientific consensus. The scientific consensus is that human activity has immensely impacted the nature of our climate and therefore we have to change the nature of our human activity. Or similar kinds of, 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 of statements. I'm putting that in the most abstract of ways, of course, but that can be translated into ways that both allow better kinds of public policy to be developed, better kinds of policies uh, uh, within different institutions that, uh, that take on board the kind of scientific knowledge they can learn about through interacting with us here, and, uh, and, and, and knowledge, too, that can be internalized by, by various kinds of publics who have become so distrustful, so skeptical about, uh, about science and about scientific expertise that I think we really have to go back to the drawing board to think about how we can create uh, a better set of uh, not just understandings, but a better basis on which there can be trust about what scientists say about things like human disease uh, so that we don't constantly fall into these political these political, really uh, horrible uh, uh, um, modes of paralysis around around even whether we should take a vaccine. Where do you think the mistrust of science comes from? There's a long history of mistrust of science, and it's not something that started in 2016 uh, uh, in the U.S. <laughs> uh, uh, there was uh, a lot of distrust of science going back to Darwin. Uh, there were... Uh, you know, famous debates over whether one should teach evolution or not in the schools that go back to uh, the Scopes trial in the early 20th century in Tennessee. Uh, and in fact, of course, we see uh, these kinds of debates continue in certain places as to whether to teach uh, the biblical account of creation or evolution. But the point here is that, uh, you know, science will come up with uh, understandings that sometimes run up against religious belief, uh, and then become deeply troubling to, uh, uh, to individuals for whom that religious belief is compelling. In a way, it takes me back to the way we started this conversation because, uh, you know, there is a uh, um, cultural difference everywhere we look. Uh, and it's not just cultural difference in the sense that you have a group of people who share a single culture all the same way, all it's the same time. The culture as well. It's also about differences that have to do with individuals, and individuals will participate within cultural modes of knowing at the same time that they'll have very specific and uh, sometimes, you know, um, uh, 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 understandings of the world that are about their own 
personality formation and the like that uh, requires the field of psychology to be brought into these 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 debates as well. But the the point here being that if we are to advance science, we have to take a much more holistic approach to what science is uh, and how we create new ways, perhaps, to translate scientific knowledge into what might be seen as more acceptable uh, or uh, formulations that might uh, uh, might develop greater forms of trust. And maybe, for example, uh, we need to be clearer about the fact that scientists sometimes do disagree, that there are debates, and that there isn't just one single kind of, uh, of, 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 of facts that are, are settled for all time. I liked what you said about a process. It's a process. And, and I think we have to assume that people are, you know, they're not stupid. They're, they're, they, they, see, they see every, every few weeks a new study comes out. It says that if you diet in this way or you exercise <laughs> in that way, you're going to lose weight. And then it tells you, you know, a year later, no, we got that wrong. Um, other studies show that, you know, something else is the case. Well, <clears throat> in, uh, if, you, if you don't actually create the basis on which one can understand that science does in fact change over time, then you can uh, basically open up these, uh, these kinds of uh, studies to the politicians or the naysayers who simply want to appropriate them to say, you see, there's no agreement at all. I mean, uh, there's, no under- there's no agreement about climate change. Uh, scientists are still debating it. So we don't have to do anything. Let's wait until the science is settled. Well, unfortunately, there'll be a lot else that will settle uh, before the science is completely settled about anything including climate change. Right. It never really settles. It's a constant progression. It's a constant progression. But I do think we have to find ways to be more authentic uh, and more transparent in the, in the way we talk about the knowledge that uh, we ascribe scientific authority to. Uh, at the same time that we don't talk in ways that are so technical and so, um, dare I say, authoritative that they put people off and they make, uh, they make science appear to be uh, a, a language that is only about talking down to people rather than engaging them in a productive way. Right. Because I think in the heart of science, you have this, ve- you know, the scientific method and the philosophy of science in general is the pursuit of truth and in a way that is as unbiased as possible and being open to to failing, you know, in your experiments and that gets you closer to the truth. And we we don't always live up to that as scientists because we're only human and sometimes uh, egos can get in the way. But I think understanding what what's at the core of science and how beautiful it is uh, and if that were communicated to people in a better way, like you said, not in a authoritative way or a patronizing way because, you know, we're, we're, we're doing our best and it is a, a constant process. So, so I, I hope, you know, we'll, we'll be able to communicate that in a better way because there is really something beautiful about science. And I wanted to ask you in the academy right now, what scientific innovations are you most excited about? So the academy does a number of different things, and uh, it works at a number of different levels. We have a number of educational programs, some of which begin for young people in middle school, and uh, we have programs that uh, we call STEM City because we uh, provide different kinds of STEM educational opportunities for uh, after-school programs in, in parts of, uh, of New York and other cities that uh, don't have a lot of great after-school programming. We work with talented uh, young people from ages of 13 to 18 around the world, and we uh, create different kinds of what we call innovation challenges that uh, students can work on. They can work on using a digital platform. We always provide a mentor from our scientific community who works with the teams that are set up and uh, both inspires them and uh, and helps them. Uh, but we um, we work, again, at a lot of different uh, levels to try to promote scientific 
not just knowledge, but to promote the excitement of, 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 of thinking about science and the process of scientific discovery. We have a program called The Thousand Girls, A Thousand Futures that is specifically uh, um, directed to trying to bring more young women into, into science. <clears throat> and we are extending and expanding that program in hopes that we can also have impacts not only in, uh, uh, in New York and the U.S., but in places like the Middle East where, uh, where, where women's education and science is a particular uh, challenge. But when we, uh, when we conduct scientific conferences, which is a other, another whole domain of, of work that we do, we, we're, we're, we're really doing two different things. On the one hand, we're presenting state-of-the-art scientific understandings about particular issues. We have conferences on things that range from CRISPR-Cas9 and uh, genetic engineering to conferences on machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, to new materials, to uh, polymers, we 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 have conferences on just about everything in uh, the larger domain of science, and we have uh, uh, found that 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 the academy has the kind of respect uh, among the scientific community that means when we call somebody up and say, "Will you appear on a panel to talk about your research?" They invariably say yes. This was also very fortunate, by the way, in the immediate aftermath of the uh, of, of the pandemic beginning, because we were able to call up the leading virologists and then vaccinologists as they were developing an understanding first of the coronavirus and then of the possibilities of making vaccines, so that we had terrific people <clears throat> uh, appearing in our in our conferences to talk about uh, the the pandemic itself. But we do that across a range of different fields. And there, we're not creating this new knowledge. We're, we're, we're in a way, showcasing it. So a lot of what we do, uh, as I've you know, suggested, is one of the reasons I'm so happy to be at the Academy is to open up scientific knowledge to a broader public than would be uh, able to uh, participate in a conference that would take place either in a university or an R&D lab in a, in, a, in a pharma company or wherever it might take place. Uh, and the digital transformation has allowed us to make this available even more broadly than before. So it's a very exciting moment in some ways in terms of uh, of, of bringing in new uh, uh, new people who uh, who can participate in our in our programming. Uh, we also uh, recognize scientists, and when I say recognize, I I mean we actually reward uh, scientists. We give prizes. Uh, we give prizes specifically to younger scientists. Scientists who aren't at the stage of their career when, for example, they'll get a Nobel Prize. But scientists, when they're doing the work that, you know, often becomes the basis for subsequent work that will go on to earn them uh, uh, other prizes like the Lasker and the, and the Nobel. Uh, and uh, uh, the largest number of awards we give are through a program that has been uh, funded by Len Blavatnik, and we call them the Blavatnik Awards. And in fact, uh, uh, in, uh, in early August this year, we'll be having an award ceremony in Jerusalem that we do wow. in collaboration with the Israel Academy of, uh, of, of Humanities and Science. Uh, and um, that's a very exciting uh, event. And uh, we've, of course, had to put it off for a little while, at least put off uh, uh, um, the actual in, in-person physical event. Uh, but we're very excited that that will be the first of, of, of several awards events taking place over the next months. But the point of these awards, and there are others that are supported by, uh, by others, including the Takeda Pharmaceutical Company, that um, the point of them is, to, uh, is really to say, look, you know, science is exciting. We try to get young people excited about, about doing it, about studying it. Uh, but we also try to uh, encourage the younger scientists who have to work really, really hard to, you know, go through their PhDs and then get their postdocs and then get their academic appointments or at least their research appointments. Uh, and then, you know, as we were saying, fail a lot because you, you, you only do science by, by trying things out that may not work. Uh, but when something works and when some insight really is generative in a way that, uh, again, won't typically get them anything more than a approving nod from a dean or something <laughs> like that in a university, uh, we go and we give them a, um, a nice 
pot of money that they can use for anything they want and also in a, a ceremony where we really uh, you know feature the work that they do and the excitement that is generated around around their their role in science. Incredible. That can so, make a real difference in so someone's career. Yeah, it, 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 and people who get that tend to say, you know, that was more important than anything else because it was at a time when I really needed it. I really needed that kind of recognition. I really needed that kind of support. That vote of confidence that I'm on the right path. So, you know, we, uh, uh, we do education, we do conferences, we do awards, we do publications. We have a very old and distinguished journal called the Annals of the New York Academy of Sciences that continues to publish some of the uh, state-of-the-art work in, uh, in most fields in, in science. It also has a, a particular feature, which, it, uh, which is that uh, we commission essays basically to characterize recent advances in particular fields of science. So it's not only original research, but it's also a kind of a review essay. So that if you're really tracking, you know, you want to know what of interest has been done in RNA research over the last 12 months, check out the annals and you'll see that there'll be articles there that will be uh, real um, uh, surveys of, of, of recent exciting work in particular in discrete scientific fields. <laughs> so we do a lot, of, uh, a lot of, I think, very, very important things. Uh, but we're, uh, we're beginning to do a lot of new things, too. Uh, one thing that we have just announced is something we're calling at this point the International Science Reserve. We got a planning grant from IBM to start this. And it was a grant that was generated out of uh, something that IBM started as well in, uh, in the immediate weeks after the pandemic began in March of 2020 through something that was called the High Performance Computing Consortium. The HPCC was effectively a, uh, an effort to find surplus computational capacity in some of the big supercomputers and national labs and universities and uh, in, in, in industrial contexts uh, uh, to basically see if we could use some of that excess computational capacity for people who were doing COVID-specific research and they needed very quickly to have more computational power than they were able to secure on their own. And so actually some of the work that went into the development of the vaccine, some work that, uh, for example, established that you could use a ventilator for more than one patient came out mm-hmm. of the HPCC. Wow. And, and it was an enormously, I think, uh, productive uh, experience because you had people who typically would compete against each other working collaboratively with each other. Now, of course, a crisis is good for that. During a crisis, people, you know, they throw aside their 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 competitive instincts and hope. they say we're all in it together well <laughs> there, were, there were there were moments of great cooperation even yeah. among the uh, you know the big big pharma groups that were racing towards a vaccine but the um but the HPCC was a success and so what we're hoping to establish in this this idea we call the international science reserve is a network that wouldn't just be about computational resources it would be about connecting or putting together a network of scientists and scientific institutional resources that could be mobilized in the event of the next catastrophe to start working together immediately on a problem. And we know there'll be more. Uh, we, there might be another pandemic, although the next time around, it may be a very different kind of pandemic. It may be, for example, a pandemic created by a waterborne pathogen that would require completely different protocols than airborne patho- uh, pathogens. <clears throat> we do know that, uh, uh, that when there is a crisis, we tend to do what the generals call uh, fight the last war. Uh, so and we, what does that mean? Uh, you mean you have a, had a crisis? Mm-hmm. Well, we did it. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll respond to the new crisis the same way we, we responded to the I old see. crisis. I see. But it's a different crisis. So, uh, so we not only want to put together a network, we want to activate that network periodically to conduct what we're calling readiness exercises to begin to think about what the next war might require. And so using ideas of scenario planning and, um, well, readiness procedures, we hope to be able to come up with a whole set of potential challenges and uh, begin to think about who 
could work together and how they would work together to accelerate dramatically our capacity to respond should, God forbid, another one of these world-scale crises just begin without notice. Uh, and again, there could be other kinds of, uh, of pandemics, but there could be, uh, we've, we've experienced recently an increase in cyber hacking and cyber attacks. A cyber attack could disable an uh, energy grid in a, in a major way for a long period of time. A tra- uh, it could disable a transportation network. It could do real harm to, um, you know, to our capacity to deliver health care or any number of other services that are required to even sustain life. It could be, therefore, as challenging in some ways as the pandemic has been. Uh, and we think there are ways to prepare uh, and to prepare without again, without having people just uh, write checks or whatever, but really just devote a certain amount of their time and commit uh, uh, in the event of need a certain set of resources to uh, bring together uh, the right kinds of people and the right kinds of capacities to, to, to deal with future challenges of a, of a pandemic nature. So, uh, IBM came to the academy and said, we'd like you to, uh, to organize this. Uh, and so we're in the process of thinking about um, what it would take to put this together. And we think that's uh, an exciting thing to do, not to think about another catastrophe, but <laughs> to be positioned in a place where we use our convening power precisely now to address future challenges of that kind, uh, um, as we know we're going to have to. I think it's so valuable to create that collaboration and to to put in the proper incentives for that cooperation between different disciplines and to allow people to really, really progress science in the spirit in which it was intended, right? And as well as in the young generation of scientists and also in these fields of being ready for a crisis, I think having people collaborate in that kind of way is revolutionary. Really? Well, you know, the capacity to collaborate is really important. And we know the comp- competition does, uh, you know, it gets people moving more quickly. And it obviously has a huge incentivizing kind of function for our behavior as, as human beings. But, uh, but we, have to, we have to collaborate uh, under certain kinds of conditions. And, and I think, um, I think what the academy is good for because we're a kind of neutral global institution uh, is a spa- is is providing a space where that kind of collaboration can take place uh, both to advance knowledge and in this case to advance the capacity to translate knowledge into action should we need it and you know there are other things we're doing too but uh, I'll just end with perhaps one last uh, project that we're trying to develop which is to uh, create a set of senior fellowships that will bring scientists to the academy, say, for nine months or maybe for a year, uh, to um, to indulge something that they don't always get the opportunity as, sci- as practicing scientists to indulge, which is to say to get away from the, from the bench for a little while and to think about the big issues that, uh, again, correspond to some of the things, things we've been talking about uh, here together, but which... Uh, which take one a little bit away from the core of one's own scientific research and 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 preoccupation. Uh, so, for example, you could imagine uh, bringing uh, as a senior fellow somebody who's doing really important work in CRISPR-Cas9, but you're going to give them the opportunity and um, and 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 support to uh, to think about well, what are the ethical issues in uh, in genetic engineering. Uh, we might all agree that um, we should use CRISPR-Cas9 to cure diseases that are genetically transmitted, diseases like <clears throat> sickle cell anemia or, uh, or or Huntington's disease, which are very both very cruel genetically transmitted diseases. But as anyone knows who's thought about what is possible with the new technology of CRISPR-Cas9. Um, what happens if you say, well, you know, I, I'd like to um, make sure that my child is not only healthy, but is um, um, a good sports person. Or, you know, you can imagine any number of other things. So that, of course, the way this gets talked about in the public media is, you know, designer babies. <laughs> but there's a very 
blurry line between curing a disease that is discreet and enhancing a human to optimize them for things that may go beyond a very specific health predicament to things that are much broader uh, and potentially uh, go well beyond, you know, the simple domain of health. Yeah, and starting to tamper with these things ourselves. Can... Yeah, so we think, you know, that to have a group of people who understand the science, but who would benefit from a uh, from an opportunity to sit with people who are philosophers and ethicists and social policy people and people in the biomedical world uh, would 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 really be a, a, a an important thing for uh, for them and a great way for the academy again to translate into concrete programming our commitment to bring people together from different domains. So, so these are all part of, you know, the the way I see both the history of the academy but also of our future opportunities as we as we as we keep reinventing what an academy of sciences needs to be in the 21st century. Amazing. It sounds to me like you're really living out your dream and passion of interdisciplinary dialogue. It's getting even bigger than interdisciplinary because we're talking about bringing, you know, not only disciplines but uh but different kinds of institutions together. The public sectors and... All of that. Amazing. Um, amazing. I do have a few final questions. If you were to give advice to someone going into their undergraduate degree today, what would you want them to know going in? Well, you know, the first thing I would say is that uh, my biggest advice is to be open you might think you know what you want to do, but actually the best way to go to college is to go with an open mind and to, uh, to, 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 to really um, believe that you have the opportunity to, to change what you want to do and to use your college experience to maybe change in some fundamental way what you, what you think you can do. Uh, with your with your education, but also with your life, and uh, and that kind of openness is is something that uh, is at threat because uh, we're we're often telling young people, and if they aren't being told by parents, they're being told by economic uh, the economic picture that they really need to you know decide uh, what they're going to do and train for that, and you know get ready to get a job and uh, don't major in English. You know, there's so many uh, so many. Uh, uh, um, popular culture uh, examples of how uh, the liberal arts major or the English major has become almost the laughing stock, you know, or at least, you know, the explanation for somebody who, you know, isn't going to get a job. And I think it's been very destructive, not because I'm encouraging everybody to be an English major, but because one would hope that uh, that every college student can spend some of their time really exploring different fields. and uh, And even if they only explore them in the beginning year or two of their college career, bring what they learn from that with them when they specialize in something else. We also know that careers are changing, that people are going to have not only careers that don't even exist yet, but they're going to have many different careers over the course of their lives. So some degree of, 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 of flexibility is required as well as some degree of breadth in the education that we that, that we expect students to get and that students need to get. So first advice, openness. Don't be afraid to fail. Uh, too many students will take a course in chemistry or physics, some of the more difficult science courses, and really have a hard time at the beginning. And uh, the real point is you get thrown off the horse, get back on the horse. Uh, uh, Everybody has a hard time with some of these uh, intro courses that exist. And uh, the only way to really cope with it is to uh, just keep trying and, and, and not to feel that uh, if you fail once, you're doomed to fail forever in that particular field. Uh, and, and so uh, a certain kind of persistence along with openness, I think, I think is important. But, you know, the, the truth is that, uh, that it's... It's, it's a time of great anxiety for young people. And uh, the more we can do institutionally to try to allay some of, the, some of the sources of that or for that anxiety, 
uh, the better, because we we really do have to acknowledge that uh, people are, aren't making up the reasons for this uh, 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 anxiousness they feel, but um, but 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 the task of, of of the college educator is to try to really make it as smooth a process as possible, so that students really do feel that they can take the time to experience the full range of opportunities that that do exist in 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 most college and university educational curricula. Wonderful. Wonderful. And with that hopeful message, I think this is a great place to stop. <laughs> thank thank you, you. Thank you so much for the conversation today. It was fascinating. Well, thank you, Ronnie. And I uh, really appreciate the questions that uh, you've asked and also your own uh, reflections along the way. So it's been great talking to you. Thank you. For everyone out there listening, thank you for tuning in to The Bigger Picture. I hope you found this conversation interesting. You can find us on all podcasting platforms, wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to hit subscribe to stay up to date with the latest episodes. My name is Roni Firon. This is The Bigger Picture. And thank you for listening. Till next time.